Thank you for coming. My name is Mike Bull. I'm the policy director uh, at the Center for Energy and the Environment. And I was the project manager for the Energy Systems Pathways Study that uh, our team did for the city of Minneapolis, which uh, uh, our primary, one of our primary recommendations was the formation of this Clean Energy Partnership or what we'll be talking about today. Um, with me uh, today on the panel is uh, Jeff Doherty from Centerpoint Energy, uh, Brendan Slaughterbeck from the City of Minneapolis, John Farrell uh, from the Institute of Local Self-Reliance and also was a formative member of an organization, uh, the Minneapolis Energy Options, a um, group of folks who did some pretty amazing advocacy in Minneapolis, and Bridget McLaughlin uh, from XL Energy. So we're here to talk about the, 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 what the agreements, uh, the formation that led to the formation of the, this uh, Minneapolis Clean Energy Partnership that was announced uh, in mid-October. It was um, nation-leading, first-of-the-nation kind of thing, and I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, the, just before we get started, just to let you know, CDE, the organization I represent, uh, it's a data-driven, community-engaged nonprofit established in 1979, and our mission uh, is to discover and deploy the most effective uh, solutions for a healthy, low-carbon economy. Um, we do our work through some nation-leading technical research, award-winning program implementation, low-cost clean energy financing, and policy innovations that advance the broad public interest. Uh, like this clean, this clean Energy Partnership we're talking about today, and like the E21 Utility Business Model and Transformation Initiative that we talked about at the session yesterday. Uh, I mentioned the, the Minneapolis Clean Energy, uh, the Minneapolis Energy Systems Pathways Study. Uh, the context for that study is pretty important. Uh, the city was finalizing a, at the time, that uh, we started this process, the city was finalizing a, the formation of uh, the adoption of a uh, clean uh, climate uh, action plan that was headed up by Brendan Slaughterbeck, which was a uh, pretty massive undertaking by itself. That established aggressive energy efficiency and uh, renewable energy goals for the city at a time when it was becoming clearer and, uh, and well known that the franchise agreements with XL and Centerpoint were getting ready to expire by the end of 2014. Uh, as John, I'm sure, will describe more fully, this sparked a citywide conversation throughout 2013 about the future of energy services in the city and the city's relationship with the utilities that serve there. The city then set aside some funds uh, for a consultant to help explore various alternatives, and we bid on and received the project we work uh, closely with uh, the Grand Shade Law Firm, which is the, also acts as the general counsel for the Minnesota Municipal Utilities Association. And that was important because one of the things we were talking about um, in our study was uh, municipalization. And also, uh, my very good friend Brian Ross from CR Planning was part of our team. It was sort of fundamental for uh, one, of the, one of the foundational pieces of, the, of this pathway study was to establish an energy vision for the city that was later adopted and incorporated into the Clean Energy Partnership. I, at some point uh, during the q and A, I might drag Brian up to help uh, answer some questions. Just to put you on notice, Brian. <laughs> put to work here. Uh, so soon after our pathway started, uh, started, it became clear to us that the status quo was not going to allow the city to meet its aggressive clean energy goals. That it was process of establishing in their climate action plan. Under a business as usual approach, the city and the utilities generally work independent of one another on energy issues, except on an ad hoc basis. The one instrument where they come together uh, to discuss energy issues has historically been the franchise agreement, traditionally limited to discussions about the use of public rights of way for utility infrastructure in the city, and then only once every 20 years or so. Uh, we realized that the city couldn't rely on the utilities alone to meet uh, the city's energy goals. Uh, utilities are organized uh, to meet state and federal requirements within a strict regulatory framework. 
uh, utilities generally see, uh, and I'm speaking now as a former utility guy, uh, I worked for Xcel Energy for quite a while, uh, utilities generally see local government at, uh, ex energy expectations as uh, something to be managed and not necessarily met. Uh, that stance was appropriate to the previous period, uh, characterized primarily on electric stuff, uh, by large central station generation and bulk power transmission lines, uh, the overarching policy being electrification everywhere as quickly, reliably, and cheaply as possible, and it was a very successful policy. Um, but that regulatory or utility business model framework is evolving to be more responsive to customers uh, and their choices and to communities like Minneapolis. This change is driven uh, by the increasing cost effectiveness uh, uh, and reliability of distributed energy technologies. We've heard a lot about that, those things over the course of this conference. And by policies that facilitate local action to reduce the environmental impact of the energy system. In order to meet the city's energy goals, it needed more influence or control over energy services in the city. So our study, we took, uh, in addition to, we built this massive data inventory uh, for uh, energy use and production in the city. It's a, the utilities were terrific uh, partners in that and provided us pretty much what we needed in order to, to get that study done. But we also looked at four, what we ended up calling four pathways uh, uh, for uh, increasing the city responsibility and control over energy uh, services. I'll just briefly describe those four. Uh, the first was enhancing the franchise agreement, uh, which would require legislation that would allow franchise agreements to address issues beyond uh, the, the use of public rights of way in the city. So uh, things like energy efficiency goals, renewable energy goals that are specific to the city are climate uh, reduction goals. Uh, city utility partnerships was the, was the second pathway, and we'll talk more about that. Community choice aggregation was, uh, was, one, of the, was one of the pathways that we looked at. And for those who don't know, Community choice aggregation uh, would allow a city to, to take over the arrangement of arranging for power supply or energy supply for natural gas that would supply for residents and businesses within the city. It doesn't require uh, the taking over of city of utility infrastructure, so it's uh, it, it, the barriers to um, uh, community, community choice aggregation or municipal aggregation lower, uh, but in Minnesota, it, uh, it would not be allowed. That would also take a legislative uh, action. Uh, municipal aggregation is a tool that has developed in the states that have deregulated their electric industry uh, in Minnesota. Uh, long ago decided that wasn't a path they wanted to follow. And then our fourth pathway uh, was the formation of municipal utility, which uh, uh, would require the city to take over all the, the uh, energy infrastructure and delivery and, uh, of energy services and all the other aspects of providing utility services in the city. And as we looked at these four pathways, uh, the first two, enhanced franchise agreements and city utility partnerships, uh, we decided we thought would afford the city some additional influence or control over energy services in the city and can be implemented or could be implemented in a relatively shorter time frame, committing fewer resources and in conjunction with the utilities. The other two, community choice aggregation and formation of a municipal utility, would give the city significantly more control and to take substantially more time, resources, and risk uh, to implement, as well as involve the loss of utility expertise and experience and a potential uh, increase in energy rates. So we recommended uh, that the city negotiate shorter time, shorter franchise agreements, much shorter than the 20 years uh, that the previous agreements were, uh, and is, uh, also to negotiate the formation of this uh, clean energy partnership, which would be made up of city and utility leaders uh, that would meet regularly to plan, coordinate, uh, market uh, clean energy activities and programs in the city, all of which would be within the current regulatory framework consistent with current uh, state uh, clean energy requirements. Following the presentation of our study to the uh, 
uh, Minneapolis City Council. They, um, in February of last year, the city uh, hired us to help <coughs> advise them and help them negotiate the, the franchise agreements and the creation of this partnership, which we uh, did, and with the, those were announced on, yeah, I think October 17th. And the final agreements held very closely to the recommendations in the um, energy systems pathway study. Uh, just to, to summarize, I think that the, this approach, uh, this clean energy partnership, requires the city to be more engaged and have more sustained responsibility with regard to energy services. That's going to be key to, uh, the, 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 to this being successful over time. It requires the utilities to work and coordinate with the city on an ongoing basis and to meet city energy goals. It allows the city to continue to benefit from utility expertise and experience in delivering energy services in the city and helps the utilities meet their state energy efficiency and renewable energy goals by bringing both city and utility assets to bear on accelerating implementation uh, and uptake of utility programs within the city. I think that last point is particularly important. If the city's clean, aggressive clean energy goals are to be met, the city needs to bring its regulatory and relationship assets to the table to be combined with utility experience and utility funding for clean energy programs. Uh, that This needs to be a partnership and uh, where all parties come together uh, to achieve shared goals. This partnership, uh, I think, is potentially the beginning stages of a new utility business model, combining assets and functions of a municipality with those of an investor-owned utility combined and dedicated to meeting public goals and purposes. Additionally, you know, since the barriers to creating this kind of thing is, are very low, it doesn't require legislative uh, authorization or regulatory approval, and doesn't require a, a, a significant commitment of upfront resources, if we can demonstrate this approach in Minneapolis, this could easily be implemented elsewhere in the state and elsewhere in the country. And we think that a network of cities that have developed local energy plans like Minneapolis's Climate Action Plan then form partnerships with their utilities to help implement those plans. That could be a tremendous force uh, for clean energy and climate action. And I'm pretty excited to see uh, this moving forward uh, in, in the home, in this home state of, uh, home city of uh, Center for Energy and Environment. Thank you, Mike. Um, as Mike mentioned, I am here uh, not only in my role at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance uh, with our Democratic Energy Program, but also as a, I like to call myself, one of the lead rabble-rousers uh, with the Minneapolis Energy Options Campaign um, that had a lot to do with getting this started. Um, I'll, I'll provide, I think, a couple of things here. One is stepping back a little bit in history about what motivated a lot of this conversation to get started in Minneapolis and then step forward and say, now that we have this partnership, here's what we're hoping to see come of it. Um, you know, it, as a bit of background, I think what's important to understand is that while the, the official city sustainability plan, the official city climate action plan are definitely the levers uh, that we looked at using in terms of saying this is what residents and businesses in the city of Minneapolis care about, um, you know, one of the primary motivators of the Minneapolis Energy Options Campaign was to say how much money do we spend collectively as a city on these energy services and how much of that is actually leaving the city of Minneapolis. So I'll actually ask that as a question. I'm looking for a number in millions of dollars collectively, residents and businesses in the city of Minneapolis on an annual basis, what do we spend for gas and electricity services? Not all at once. I guess in the billions. Oh, come on, folks. It is the end of the conference day. I understand. It's hard. 30 million. 30 million. Okay. Higher. 200 million. Higher. 400, 450 million is the answer. Really Thank you for the folks who are waking up. You guys must be the ones that got coffee before the session. Um, <laughs> so the, the $450 million is, you know, a lot of that money is spent actually delivering the services. Don't get me wrong, we're not talking about money that can all be done in Minneapolis. There are certainly things, maintenance of the grid system, the pipelines, and, and purchasing of the fuels and whatnot, that there's money that can't necessarily be recaptured. But a lot of it is money that can be recaptured uh, within the local economy, especially as Mike mentioned when you're talking about 
uh, really a transformation taking place in the technology and the electricity sector, allowing you to generate energy much closer to home than we ever had be have before, and with much different ownership structures than we've had over the past 80 to 100 years in the electricity sector. So there was a big focus from the start on this notion of not just how do we meet energy and climate goals, which are important to folks in the city of Minneapolis, but also how do we look at this as an economic opportunity. Um, and so the, you know, the campaign, frankly, got together. It was a few people sitting on the table and saying, well, this is really interesting and we care about these big numbers, but what are we going to do about it? What are the opportunities for us to do anything about this? And we had heard about some other interesting things going on, like in Boulder, Colorado, where they're talking about municipalization. I mean, they've frankly been talking about that for a long, long time. They're going to continue to talk about it for a long, long time as ballot initiatives go by and, and legal fights go on. Um, and we said, well, we don't know that that's really the place to go. Plus, we haven't really tried anything else yet. So it seems sort of silly to be saying, well, let's go out and form our own utility. But we haven't even really talked to the ones that we've got about what we could do with working with them. Um, but we were also realistic about the fact that there's not necessarily a lot of leverage that a city has. As Mike mentioned, most of the regulatory process for energy is at the state level and the federal level. So we said, well, we probably do have to look at what's in the toolbox. And municipalization is one of the tools in the toolbox. Is there a way that we can say, that we can sort of grab hold of that lever and say, we want to th think about what the city could do if the city was running its own utilities? And that provides some leverage so that when the city sits down to have its conversations with the utilities, there's a real opportunity there to talk about what the differences could be in terms of governance structure and, and where we could go with that. Um, and the whole thing sort of snowballed in 2013. We had a city election. We had a lot of candidates talking about it, the mayoral candidates talking about it, city council candidates talking about the campaign. Uh, we had this specter of a, a ballot initiative around municipalization um, that didn't materialize. Um, I think there were a lot of really interesting reasons why it didn't. And you know, in the end, I think it led to um, something very positive, which is this first in the nation partnership uh, between a city and its utilities to explore not only you know, the two thirds of climate emissions that are the result of electricity and gas consumption that the city really didn't have any opportunity to influence before, uh, but also that $450 million in the, that's being spent in the local economy and how that could be kept more local. So now we have this thing and you know, we had a, I, one of the testifiers at the city council hearing said, you know, our job now is to figure out how this doesn't become the quarterly coffee clatch for the city folks and the utilities and how do we make sure we actually have real substantive conversations about it. And I think everybody's coming to the table interested in that. Like what are the ideas that we can generate? What are the possibilities? And I think there are sort of three key things at stake. The first one is, what do we think that we, what ideas can we generate that are innovative and ambitious and measurable and achievable within a short time frame? Because we've established for ourselves that this partnership can go on as long as 10 years, but we've got a check-in point of about five years, which means we really got to start ha having stuff happen within two to three years if we want to know whether or not this is working or not uh, for the city to evaluate whether or not this is in fact the, ba in fact the best pathway for it to use. Uh, as, as one of the strategies that was outlined in the study that CEE performed. Um, and, and you know, we're going to come to the table, the Minneapolis Energy Options or Community Power Organization is going to come to the table with some great suggestions. We hope the utilities will come with some. We're going to be challenging both the city and the utilities to put things out there. As, as Mike said, you know, what can the city put on the table with its regulatory authority um, over local property? What can the utilities bring to bear with their, the data that they have about our local grid and the knowledge that they have about installing local solar and all those things? Um, uh, and, and so, you know, what are the ideas that we can generate? Number two is can we, can we find a way to do that and, and to set ourselves real benchmarks and, and for accomplishing these things? Can we say two years from now that we are going to make, you know, meaningful and, and substantial progress on energy efficiency by retrofitting a certain number of homes? Can we do it in a way that focuses on communities that are, have been traditionally disadvantaged where um, folks pay a disproportionate share of their monthly income on energy and s and, and, and frankly, uh, from a sort of crude economics, economist perspective, where we have the greatest opportunity for benefit. If we save those folks money, they're not going to be stuffing it away in a savings account. They have other expenses. They're going to spend it again in the local economy. There's an opportunity there. Um, the same thing with local solar. You know, what can we do accomplish with community solar over the next couple of years in Minneapolis? What are going to be the opportunities to uh, get synergies between the energy savings programs for electricity and gas? Because frankly, a lot of the stuff that we can do in a home or in a business in a building uh, can affect both. And I think finally, you know, when I think about kind of what the opportunity is here, I think about 
how do we not only come up with these innovative policies and set ourselves very good targets for how we achieve them, but how do we then let this be part of the bigger national conversation about how do we structure a utility business model that serves the principles and goals not only of the city of Minneapolis, but writ large all of the utility customers who care about things like clean energy, like saving money with conservation, and figure out how we test out new policies. So how can Community Power, as an organization that has been you know, out here agitating for local economic development, connection to energy, go with Excel and CenterPoint to the Public Utilities Commission and say, we got to be honest, it's going to be pretty hard for this to be replicable if we can't find a way for them to get paid, letting us generate more energy locally that's not done by the utilities. Because right now, that's probably not their incentive. So I think that's really you know, a, a, a very important key piece of this is can we make meaningful, innovative, and ambitious commitments? And then can we go hand in hand to the Utilities Commission, who I think has expressed a lot of interest in this, and say, what are we going to do to change the big picture to make sure that this is something that we can do that makes sense for Minneapolis, that makes sense for the state of Minnesota, but is something that we can take to all those other cities that um, have established these ambitious local plans? Uh, thank you, John and Mike. Uh, again, my name is Brendan Slaughterback. I work um, in the city of Minneapolis Sustainability Office, and I've had the, the pleasure of working on both the climate action plan that Mike mentioned, and um, now uh, a lot of work on the, the forming of the, the Clean Energy Partnership. Um, I have a, a lot of things to say, but Mike and John have said a lot of things already, which is you know always the danger of going in the middle or you know looking at the utilities. They have to go last, so I guess I shouldn't complain too much. But maybe I'll just say what they're going to say. Um, just, I was going to go back and do, do a little bit of history uh, from the city perspective, um, at least as far as I can go back, um, uh, and maybe push back a tiny bit on one thing that Mike said. But uh, So Minneapolis has actually had, um, I, I have to do the, the, the boosterism a little bit, so please forgive me, but Minneapolis has actually had a climate action plan uh, of sorts since 1993. Uh, which was um, way before many people were, th were thinking about these things, and it was a joint plan actually done between Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, we still have a copy of it in our office, but it's only a, a paper copy. I think someone did scan it as a PDF, but it's not, you can't search the PDF because it's a scan, and nobody has any idea where any of the data is or how they came up with any of the numbers. So uh, we looked at that and we said, this is kind of cool, but we have no idea what these numbers mean or, or how, who even came up with these numbers. So, the the, maybe the show. So, yeah, I and mean, he probably has enough uh, slides in a, yeah, in a dusty box or something. But, so anyway, we, um, back in, uh, before even 2012, I think we started even in 2011, we um, decided that the city was gonna uh, re-draft uh, our climate action plan or update our climate action plan. Um, the city had had some goals adopted by the city council for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So they had goals that were pretty consistent with what the state of Minnesota says, that say we want to reduce our emissions 15% by 2015, 30% uh, by 2025, and now we have one that's also 80% or more by 2050. Um, so we had these goals that have been adopted by the city council, but we didn't necessarily have uh, minus the 1993 plan that was sitting on a shelf. We hadn't really taken a comprehensive look in a while at how does a city go about really making progress on these goals. So we spent about a year kind of scoping out that process and then um, we spent all of 2012 and a good part of 2013 actually uh, doing a pretty extensive stakeholder engagement process, which included a lot of folks from the community, uh, a lot of folks from our Environmental Advisory Commission, um, some experts from the utilities, from CEE, um, from the state of Minnesota, Met Council, MnDOT, lots of other folks to take a look at. What are all the across the spectrum of emissions? So not just energy utilities, but transportation, waste, all the sectors, and came up with a plan uh, to do that. And that plan was adopted by the city council in. Um, I think it was June of 2013, um, and to be honest, I think I don't, you know, I don't want to 
a horn that's partially mine at least, but, but that discussion about the climate action plan, the process leading up to the adoption and the actual adoption, I think did lay some of the framework, at least in the policymakers' minds about this is an issue that we should, that we are talking about, that we should be talking about, and now we have kind of a framework with which to, to think about this. So that, that was a little bit of the context that started to um, set the stage a little bit too for um, the elections in 2013 where uh, community power and, uh, or at the time MEO really started to have these conversations in the political arena about, you know, we've got this plan, we have these goals, we need some more leverage. Um, so like John was talking about, what are we gonna do? Uh, and these franchise agreements, the expiration of these might be the real opportunity for us or the point of discussion to kind of talk about uh, what we might do. Um, you know, just a little, I guess, to be perfectly candid from a, from a staff level, we were at one point kind of perplexed about the conversation about municipalization. We we're like, we're not Boulder, we're, we're in the middle of the grid, you know, we're much larger. Uh, XL headquarters is like two blocks away from the city hall and we're like, is this, like, is this really gonna, like, what's going on here? Like, is this really gonna work? And then, but, you know, I, I will, I do have to give a lot of credit to the advocates in the, in the community for, for having a little bit of vision and, and saying this is, this is a leverage point and this will start a conversation with policymakers. Um, you know, I'll also give a lot of credit to the utilities who did a pretty, uh, Pretty amazing job turning people out for that public hearing that we had about municipalization. So that was that was kind of uh, it was a very interesting time in uh, uh, that fall. But it really uh, raised this this topic to a level that you know any person working in the sustainability office of any major city gets just all giddy about because when you've got all the council members talking about climate change and energy and utilities, you know, if, if you're in public works, you get super excited and talking about snow plowing or whatever, and then you want the council members to pay attention to what you're doing. So, you know, it's it, it's great job security, of course, but, but you know, I do give a lot of credit to them for, for raising that issue um, and bringing that to the forefront. And so that, um, like John said, I think he gave a good synopsis of, of um, where, where we are today, uh, you know, we did spend a significant amount of time developing that, that climate action plan. And I think um, when Mike said, you know, lots of cities can do this, I think you can't underestimate the amount of time and energy you have to put into the community engagement process, whether it's on the discussion of municipalization or, or a clean energy partnership, or it's kind of the lead up to that. And, communities looking at their energy system and what the details are and kind of how, what pathways they can walk down to, to reach their goals. Because you do have to lay that groundwork with a lot of people like, you know, if you talk to the, the person on the street, a lot of them probably don't know that two thirds of the emissions from Minneapolis come from buildings or from, you know, from the utility sector basically. Uh, you, ha you have to lay that groundwork and you've got to do a lot of work to get there in the community before you can work on this. So uh, we, you know, it's it's definitely a, a step forward for communities uh, because we look at this as an opportunity for cities to have a, a bigger role in that discussion. But there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of work that has to be done to kind of lead up um, lead up to that process. So um, that's a little bit of a, a history, I guess just going forward or thinking about it into the future, you know, the city's plans, uh, we were very happy to conclude negotiations with Sandpoint and Excel uh, this, this summer or fall, I suppose, uh, on both our franchise agreements and these sort of, uh, there's a second set of agreements called clean energy agreement. So uh, the technical details are that the, the franchise agreements were renegotiated for a much shorter time period. So traditionally these have been 20 year documents and as John alluded to now our document is, it's a 10 year document but it kind of has a, a, a check-in point possibly at five years. Uh, and then parallel to that we've negotiated with the utilities 
clean energy agreements. And these are the agreements that really set up the framework for what are the discussions that are going to be had between the utilities and the city. And in those clean energy agreements, it kind of lays out a, a clean energy board. So the city, uh, uh, the city will be sitting on that board, and both utilities will be sitting on that board. That includes the mayor, two council members, and then uh, two representatives from each utility, and the city coordinator uh, for Minneapolis, which is kind of like a city manager. Um, so that's that's the framework. We that agreement also established a, an advisory committee. So um, we have something that will be called. Uh, I think it will be called an energy vision advisory committee that is going to be made up of a lot of uh, critical uh, communities from Minneapolis that we want to have feedback on what the work plan of this board is. So we want to, um, you know, we we like to do boards and commissions in Minneapolis. It, uh, it is a way to, to do community engagement, but um, that's kind of the way we're going with it. And this board that's formed will come up with something like a, a two-year work plan, um, you know, on a, on a cycle. And we're hoping that to use that advisory committee, um, as well as other methods, to kind of give, give feedback to that board. But as John was kind of alluding to, some of the things that we are hopeful that that board will be discussing are, what are the ways we can leverage utility programs, so that's existing utility programs and potentially new utility programs, uh, to deliver uh, more energy efficiency <coughs> services to uh, residents and businesses in Minneapolis. What are ways we can uh, look at the same for renewable energy uh, in the city of Minneapolis? How can we make sure the community solar program, which is new, is really successful, and we can have a lot of people that, uh, a lot of people from different uh, communities in Minneapolis participating in those kinds of programs? Um, and there's a lot of the stuff that's maybe not as uh, uh, high profile that um, that I actually get even more excited about. Uh, too, which is like more sharing of data between the utility and the city, more discussions about investment decisions. So I think the city and the utility will benefit uh, extremely from this in, in the idea that we can talk really about what is the, how do we plan infrastructure together? You know, what does the distribution system look like? What is the usage and uptake of energy efficiency programs? How does that vary across the geographies of Minneapolis? So there's actually a lot if you look at the agreement about how we're going to sort of jointly plan and discuss some of this data um, that that we previously really were only thinking about in our own kind of uh, own kind of silos, um, so we're we're very excited about that. Um, so what you should look for is in January or uh, January February early next year, hopefully January, we're going to start that board will begin meeting uh, the advisory committee soon after that and um, something like a, a draft work plan that that board will, will adopt. And then, uh, as John said, we want to think about how we can track that carefully over that time period. Our policymakers are very interested in what the outcome of this will be, so we're going to be reporting back to them on something like an annual basis of what we've come up with, what we're delivering together. Um, so we're very cognizant of how we can track um, the success over time. Um, but on the city side, for us, importantly, it's not, the partnership is a key focus of our work. I think we're also very focused on continuing to stay engaged at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, there's hopefully things we're going to be going to the PUC jointly with utilities, but we, there's a lot of important issues that we feel we just need to be engaged on uh, in addition, you know, including thinking about what's appropriate for us to talk about in terms of the rate cases, the resource plan, um, and, and, and other issues, um, uh, including, including data, which I won't go into too much, but is a, another fun topic. Um, so so um, we're, very, we're very hopeful. I think expectations are high. We have the policymakers' attention right now. Um, this is, you know, from sustainability staff, this is the time to strike while the iron is hot. You know, and really, um, really try to deliver on some of the goals that we have for climate and energy. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Until we launch the video. Well, good afternoon, everybody.
Yeah. My name is Jeff Dougherty. I'm responsible for the regulatory and legislative activities for Center Point Energy here in the state of Minnesota. Just a little background on Center Point Energy, we're the state's largest natural gas utility. We serve about 850,000 customers here in the state. So I think a question you may be asking yourself is, what does a utility think about this clean energy partnership idea? And uh, from, from Center Point's perspective, uh, we think it just makes good business sense. And let me share with you a little bit of why. Um, and, and I come at it from several different facets here. One facet is just that we've been in the community for over 130 years. We feel like we're a part of the fabric of this community. Minneapolis is important to us, and that's our heritage, and it's part of being a good neighbor. So from that aspect, it's just a natural fit. From a pure business aspect, it's also a natural fit. It is in this way, in several ways, actually. First off, the policy structure here in Minnesota is set up perfectly, quite frankly, for the natural gas utility to be partners with the city of Minneapolis, others on energy policy. You have cost recovery for our conservation programs. We have financial incentives for the energy savings that we have. We have uh, the coupling programs. All those things line up to make it so that we have vested interest to generate more energy savings, and that's what the city of Minneapolis wants to do, to generate more energy savings as well. So our interests are perfectly aligned in that, in that way. The next thing is that uh, and I think the state of Minnesota should feel very good about themselves for a number of years of conservation programs. They've been doing conservation programs for a long, long time, back the, into the early 80s, is when they, everything really started picking off. And Excel does a great job with their conservation programs. So Center Point Energy is recognized nationally as one of the leaders in natural gas conservation programs. Our programs are there. We, as I said, we have an opportunity to work with the city to deliver these conservation programs to more customers and help our customers save energy, which helps the environment and helps the city get their objectives. So again, from our standpoint, uh, it just makes good business. Good business sense. So thank you. What Jeff didn't mention also is that Centerpoint was recently named uh, as the number one natural gas utility conservation This is something they've been working at pretty hard at the Prosper. So I'm Bridget McLaughlin with Excel Energy. And one of my key roles with the company is actually to make sure that this partnership works, that it produces um, what we said we would do, and that we work collaboratively with Center Point and with the city. Uh, we've had a great relationship with the city for quite a few years now, bumps and hurdles along the way, but you kind of have to expect that. And center point recent years, especially when it comes to the DSM programs, uh, we really have started to work at combining those gas and electric programs, looking for those um, cost savings and the, the effectiveness that you can get on those combined programs. So really everyone tapped into background and why, why it's good for the city, how this happened, the pathway study. So what I really just want to talk about is what does this mean for Xcel Energy as a whole and really why are we interested in doing this? Um, it builds on and enhances that current relationship with the city. So important to us, so critical to us. As Brendan said, this is our, this is our home city and, and we take that very seriously and we're very proud of it. Um, we're building a new building in downtown Minneapolis that will be completed in 2016, and Center Point is doing the same thing. Um, it gives us the opportunity to enhance relationships with a larger variety of stakeholders than we would have ever done before, um, MEO being one of those. I know bumps and hurdles with that too. Happens in the process. Uh, the partnership itself, Brennan talked a little bit about the types of programs and, and concepts that we're looking at, but the city of Minneapolis being so receptive to looking at things differently gives us the opportunity to do a lot of pilot testing. And we know that these folks are going to be receptive to that and they're going to be engaged and they're going to be following some of their consumption. Uh, it will also give us the opportunity to leverage city channels to broaden the customer outreach. Mike spoke to, this is a true partnership. 
This isn't just the city trying to make this happen. This isn't just Centerpoint. This isn't just Excel. This is a true partnership. And with that, we all have a lot of channels and a lot of outlets to be able to engage customers and ratepayers and residents and businesses within the city. And uh, lastly, and probably the biggest thing, is it really opens us up to a new perspective. I, some of you have been here yesterday too, I know they talked about the changing utility model structure. This follows suit with it. You know, truly the, the utility industry is changing constantly and the old school electric and gas utility models aren't really going to cut it anymore. And we're trying to find the best way to manage that. And these types of partnerships are the, a great opportunity to really leverage that. So I have. You know, uh, Brian, I don't know if you, if Brian, uh, Brian Ross uh, from TRK, besides being a partner uh, in, the, in the energy systems pathway study, is also a longtime member of the city's citizen environmental advisory commission and uh, previous to the, to the, uh, to the study and is back on SEAC. Now, do you have anything you, what's from you, I wonder if you wouldn't mind, you know, this is a point where you guys are supposed to ask us questions, <laughs> but I'm going to ask Brian, what, do you have a sense, uh, what are your hopes and dreams for this uh, partnership, and do you have concerns that you, you think that uh, we should be positive about? Well, uh, uh, CF was uh, one of the entities kind of had a role in getting this whole thing going. Um, it, it, it was, I think, before the city council had really engaged in, in the realization that the franchises were inspired at just the same time that the climate action planning process was going on. Was, there was discussions on the environmental commission about that, that confluence of events. And they, uh, uh, so the SEAC put together a, an initial kind of set of talking points for the city to try to prompt some of that action. And some of the city people and city council actually saw that and, uh, um, and, and grabbed hold of it and moved it ahead. And, and, and then at the same time that the municipalization talk was kind of happening about the community, um, it had, had a, a similar influence on getting, getting the process going. Um, and uh, and, and SEAC, the Environmental Commission, continued to be engaged in the process um, in the creation of the energy vision and in the kind of ongoing debate of, uh, as the pathway study moved forward. And it is still continuing to, to kind of track the progress. Um, and one of the things that, that uh, as 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 a, as a environmental commission, of course, is, is uh, uh, volunteers within the community who have an interest in, in, in environmental outcomes and, and are great supporters of the work that the city did in its climate action plan, um, and are uh, I guess on a forward going basis uh, and, and similar to the the energy organization uh, very concerned but not only about the utility following through on the climate out on the um, clean energy partnership but also the city's follow through on the clean energy partnership and concerned that that the um, uh, that there won't be a kind of seizing of the shiny objects and not the meaningful policy in order to really achieve make a kind of hard and long-term choices that need to happen in order to achieve these long-term climate action. Uh, goals and, and some of the other goals that are in the energy um, energy vision statements uh, because it's not just about reducing climate uh, greenhouse gases but also about equity in rates and uh, reliability so that um, uh, service uh, as, as energy systems transform and go forward and, and how that might affect the business community and investment in, in the city so it's, it's a broad range of things and, and, and the commission the environmental uh, advisory commission is still very concerned about that and is continuing to be engaged in this process to make sure that this is moving forward. And, and, and we're, we're the primary thing that the commission is doing right now is uh, looking at the, I'm going to make sure I get the name right, environmental vision advocacy, energy vision, energy vision advisory commission, right. whatever. EVAC. Yeah, the EVAC, yeah, um, that the representation of that is reflective of the kind of stakeholder interests that there really are in the city that has a meaningful role um, in shaping and helping the
the, uh, the Clean Energy Board kind of move forward and actually make meaningful implementation. So that's kind of the role that the that, that citizen body is continuing to play um, in, in this process. So, excellent. You know, I, I understand John has to leave a little early, correct? Right? So if anybody has a specific question that they'd like to grill John about, <laughs> <laughs> this would be the time to do it. Yes, sir. Well, I, I think this is partially for John and partially for others, but uh, John will have a great perspective on it. So, a, uh, what would be your kind of your, your best practices or tips for encouraging a, a, a city leader unit or government unit that traditionally has not had much in, interest in climate action to, to maybe develop a climate action plan or move in that direction? Uh, I won't name names, but I do live in Rochester. <laughs> Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, frankly, it, it would be a lot harder than, than, than what we have in Minneapolis, uh, given the fact that there was always, already that process to hook into. I mean, I really can't underscore enough the work that Brendan and, and others in the city were doing on the climate action plan was important. But I guess what I would say is, you know, the, the Minneapolis Energy Options campaign was really a grassroots effort. I mean, we partnered with organizations that we did door-to-door -door canvassing. We went to neighborhood meetings. Um, we hosted our own you know, community gatherings and just started with basic uh, issues around energy literacy with folks. And we headlined with things like $450 million a year. And you know, do you know that your energy bill has been going up by X percent per year? And those kind of things that kind of really hit home for people in terms of this is an important issue that I need to care about. And then pivoted to this question of where are your opportunities? I mean, the beauty of Rochester is if you get the city council on board with you, you can do whatever you want. It's a municipal utility, so you can, you know, run the table, if you will, um, you know, within the reasonable bounds of fiscal prudency, of course. But, um, but, I, but I think that's kind of the, the notion here is that we've got this great opportunity where we have everybody at the table that matters, and Rochester happens to be that that's in the same entity when you're talking about the utility in the city. Um, but it really does, I, I think any, for any of these efforts to be successful, it really is a grassroots effort. When you look at what's happening in Boulder, for example, I mean, take a, just take off the table for a second that it's a conversation about municipalization specifically, it's a lot of grassroots energy that's gone into it for a long, long time, motivated by this opportunity for the local community to benefit more from its energy economy. I'd actually like to build on that. Sure. <clears throat> With Rochester specifically, and I stress sort of, you know, some of what MEO did right was exactly this leveraging opportunities and sort of the unique nature of what was happening in Minneapolis and elsewhere and finding messages that work. So if you're talking about Rochester right now, you're seeing the DMC, the Destination Medical Center. Just to be clear, I only said that I lived there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's, that's an opportunity where there are. Um, sense of each other than you had two years ago. And I wonder if you guys could think, could, could, you know, are there examples of how you do things differently today or, or um, uh, today that relative to where you were in 2012? What do you, what do you know more about each other than, than you did previously? Well, I'll start that out with the caveat in 2012 I worked at CEE. But, All um, roads lead to, <laughs> to, to and from. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, what have we learned? I think a, a case in point was when um, Mike and Brendan were approached about this panel, it was very much come to the other partners on how do, how do we want to present this the right way to anyone interested and how can they then use that? 
the replication, and that I think is a huge enhancement if we are right from the very beginning committed to doing this together. Uh, it's not on an individual basis. Um, I uh, just briefly, I think um, as we start to prepare for the Clean Energy Board to, to form, I think one difference that I see is that you know we we're now in the space where we're meeting very frequently, um, at, you know, all three entities together, and that that's something that didn't that didn't happen before. And I think if we have a question about something that we want to know, and I, I give a lot of credit to the utilities on this, if we have a question about LED street lights or something, we, we feel like we can set up a meeting and, and learn just about everything we need to learn. Um, whereas before, I think that relationship was a little bit different. There was um, you know, maybe specific people in the utility that were sort of the, the go-between, but there wasn't this sort of collaborative, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have regular meetings and discuss these issues and each understand what the other one feels. And I think maybe there's a similar sense, if I can speak for the elected officials, that during the negotiation process that they had a number of meetings where it was the executive of the <coughs> utilities meeting with kind of the executive team of the city. And I don't think that's a meeting that's, that's happened very often in, in other contexts. So, and, and that will kind of continue as this board forms, which I think will really, you know, very few things happen without relationships. So I think forming those relationships was a key piece of this. Yeah, I'll second what uh, Brendan said, Bridget. I, th I think, you know, it's been 30 years uh, when we had our last franchise with the city of Minneapolis. And I don't think it's uh, intentional uh, not to spend time with folks. Uh, we certainly have folks dedicated to working with the city of Minneapolis. Um, but it's a little bit different when uh, you, you actually sit down and invest in the relationship and consciously invest in the relationship to get to know each other. And, and not only, I mean, it's easy to assume things, you know, rather than sit down and talking through it. I mean, energy businesses has its complications to it. Running a city has its complications to it. You know, until you sit down and have a conscious way to work through that, both at the staff level and at the leadership level, and I think that's that's probably the greatest benefit out of the out of the partnership agreement uh, going forward. Thank you. All right, Bob, you had a question early. Yeah, under, under current rules or future rules, is the city of Minneapolis allowed to own some of its own solar generating and facilities, whether it's broken down or ground mounted? You want to? <laughs> Let's give John Farrell a hand. Yeah. <laughs> could you? So your question was, could the city as an entity own its own solar PV system? Yeah, could the city on a, one of its rooftops put a solar panel on the panel to use electricity, for example? Yes, we could own our own system. Um, we have a number of different systems already in place on a number of buildings. Close, I think approaching one megawatt um, right now. Some of that is ownership. Some of it, I know we have a, a third party leasing arrangement for the system on the convention center. So there's there's a couple different ways we can do it, but, but yes. Is there a limit? Uh, a limit to how much the city can own? I don't think so. Oh, well, there's a limit on for a specific project for the load, you know, but in, in total, there's, I don't think there's a limit on how many projects we can do. I got a question. Yeah. I just want to make a general comment that I think what's going on is absolutely stunning. We have an old corporate model that, that is uh, being challenged, and it's been modified and everything else. The whole thing of community collaboration is a, actually a new language done by a generation of people much younger than myself. And what we're seeing is, is a younger generation that wants to be totally engaged in the things that matter to them. And it's no longer a monopoly of, you know, a franchise agreement is a monopoly. And it, 
And the franchise agreement has been modified now and it's being seen as something that's collaborative. I think this is just totally exciting because it's engaged with the whole younger generation in things that matter a lot to them. We've really screwed up our generation. <laughs> we've left a mess behind us. We've left a terrible mess behind us. And you know, the younger generations have they've got to pick, pick up on that because you know we're not going to pay for it, they're going to pay for it. So I see, uh, I see this thing as just being terrifically exciting. Yeah. And, and uh, it's just so much fun to see people engage, it's so much fun to see at, 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 at a grassroots level, people getting into details about what their options are, 